everyone. I'm Sean Esterly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center and the International Energy Agency. And today's webinar will discuss the IEA 2014 edition of the Energy Technology Perspectives. And one important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solution Center's resource library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. And before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. You have two options for audio. You may listen through your computer or over your telephone. And if you choose to listen through your computer, just select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane uh, to eliminate any feedback and echo. And if you choose to dial in by phone, just select the telephone option, and then a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin that you should use to dial in. And panelists, we ask that you please mute your audio device while you are not presenting. And if anyone is having technical difficulties, you can uh, get assistance at the number at the bottom of that slide, which is 888-259-3826. And we encourage anyone to ask questions throughout the webinar. Uh, to do so, simply submit your questions through the question pane, and those will be presented to the panelists uh, following the presentations. And if you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, we will be posting PDF copies of the presentation to cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training, and you can follow along. And we'll also be posting a video and audio recording of this webinar to that site within about a week of the um, webinar, the broadcast. And so today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, uh, Didier Hussen and David Elzinger. And these expert panelists have been kind enough to join us to discuss key findings from the IEA's 2014 edition of Energy Technology Perspectives, which examines what must be done to provide sustainable options for generation, distribution, and end use consumption. Now before our speakers begin their presentations, I'll provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative. And then following the presentations, we'll have a question and answer session where the panelists will address questions submitted by the audience, and then some closing remarks and a very brief survey. Now this slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solutions Center came to be. And the Solutions Center is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial and is supported through a partnership with UN Energy. It was launched in April of 2011 and is primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other CEM partners. Some outcomes of this unique partnership include support of developing countries through enhancement of resources on policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as the webinar you're attending today. And there's four primary goals for the Solution Center. Our first goal is to serve as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. A second is to serve to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. And third is to deliver dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And then lastly, the center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. Now, our primary audience is energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries but we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. This slide uh, gives an overview of one of the marquee features that the Solution Center provides, which is the Ask an Expert. And Ask an Expert is, uh, has established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries at no cost. So for example, in the area of sustainable energy action planning, we're very pleased to have Mr. William Becker, a senior associate with Natural, Capital, Natural Capitalism Solutions, serving as our expert. So if you have a need for policy assistance in sustainable energy action planning or any other clean energy sector, we do encourage you to use this service. Again, it's provided to you free of charge. So to request assistance, simply submit your request by registering through our Ask an Expert feature at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. And we also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. And so in summary, we encourage you to explore and take advantage of the Solution Center resources and services, including the Ask an Expert Assistance, the Database of Clean Energy Policy Resources, uh, subscribe to our newsletter, and then participate in webinars like this one. 
So now I'd like to provide um, brief introductions for our distinguished panelists today. And our first speaker that we'll be hearing from is Didier Hussman, the Director of Sustainable Energy Policy and Technology at the International Energy Agency. And our second speaker is David Elzinger, who is a Senior Energy Technology Analyst at the at IEA, where he is leading the IEA's flagship Energy Technology Perspectives publication and worked on electricity system technology, such as smart grids, including system modeling, policy, and technology analysis. And so with those introductions, please join me in welcoming Mr. Didier Hussain to the webinar. Good, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for this introduction, and thanks to all of you for joining this webinar. Uh, it's our pleasure today to share with you some of the key results of uh, Energy Technology Perspective uh, 2014, uh, ETP uh, 2014, that was uh, launched this afternoon in Seoul by the Executive Director of the IEA here in the Clean Energy Ministerial uh, meeting. Uh, uh, ETP is one of our flagship publications in the IEA and its analysis offers a comprehensive long-term view of energy system trends and technologies that are essential to meet goals for affordable, secure, and low-carbon energy. This long-term view is regularly challenged by developments that have lasting and transformative impacts, such as the shale gas boom in North America, cost reductions in several renewable technologies, and the uncertainty in nuclear power progress. These various examples clearly show that technology, market developments, and external events influence the evolution of our energy systems. But they draw attention to a troubling fact. In face of rapidly growing demand and the increasingly urgent threat of climate change, we are continuing to respond to the energy system as it evolves, rather than actively managing its transformation in a holistic way. To achieve an energy system that is sustainable, not just in terms of reducing carbon emissions, but also in providing secure and affordable access for all, we need strong leadership. A radical change, of course, is long overdue, and EDP shows how technology can help us meet our goals, and the time is now. As you can see on this slide, when energy demand has grown, the carbon intensity of energy production has stayed the same, resulting in increasingly high emissions. Understandably, different priorities have meant that while carbon intensity has fallen in some countries, in many growth areas, a focus on economic performance is meant rapidly expanding coal use. Indeed, while emerging economies have stepped up their ambitions and become leaders in deploying low-carbon energy technologies, the ongoing allure of coal underlines the need to improve coal plant efficiency and scale up carbon capture, storage, and use. An EDP shows the change in direction we must make by looking at three main policy scenarios. The 6-degree scenarios, or 60S, is largely an extension of current trends, what happens if we have business as usual. The 4-degree scenario, or 4DS, takes into account recent pledges made by governments to limit emissions and step up efforts to improve energy efficiency. And finally, there is the two-degree scenario, or 2DS, which is the main focus of ETP 2014. This scenario describes an energy system which is consistent with limiting the increase in global temperatures to 2 degrees Celsius. This 2DS, two-degree scenario, confirms that global population and economic growth can be decoupled from energy demand, even for oil. Although analyzed through the lens of climate, it has also profound benefits for energy security and for the economy. The convergence of these topics is becoming increasingly clear. Energy efficiency remains the largest contributor to global emission reduction, particularly in transport, industry, and buildings, and we'll discuss that in a moment. But energy efficiency alone will not enable us to meet these targets. It needs to be combined with other technologies to meet our targets and how we encourage both will be key. Yet while the efforts needed for this transition are impressive, they are cost effective. Investing in clean energy will pay off, as you can see on the slide. In the, indeed, that investment to get to a clean energy system is immense. 
three US trillion US dollars of additional cost, but this represents only a small portion of global GDP and it is offset by over 150 trillion dollars in fuel savings. Even with a 10% discount rate, it pays off in the long run. But in addition to higher costs, the major challenge in making progress today is financing. Increased upfront costs of many low carbon technologies make financing more difficult. So what is the result of these challenges? And as you can see on this chart that summarizes the way we estimate clean energy progress, we're not on track. This year's picture has even become slightly more pessimistic than last year, as you can see here. We continue to delay those needed investments, and as we do this, we know that the longer we wait to transform our energy system, the more expensive it will get. There is one exception, and the exception is renewables, here in green and they are on track. But this is not enough to meet long-term sustainable energy goals. A broad range of technologies are needed across all production, generation and end-use sectors, especially in the electricity sector. And the crucial role of electricity in global energy systems is something that we need to get right. We believe it is going to play a defining role in the first half of this century as the energy career that increasingly powers economic growth and development, and that it will enable the transition to a clean energy system. This is why we've decided this year to focus our, our analysis in ETP 2014 on how, how to harness electricity potential. That's the second part of ETP 2014. And indeed, we think we have options to get it right. The challenge is immense, but the electricity sector is rich with solutions renewables, nuclear power, nuclear power, CCS, smart groups to name, it, to name a few. But we need strategic and coordinated investment to meet our goals and to leverage cleaning up electricity generation to clean up all end use sectors by switching to electricity. I would like now to turn to David Elzinger who has been the project manager for this uh, publication and he will expand further on the report. David. Uh, thank you, Didier. So, to build on the previous context, uh, I want to provide a bit more information. Electricity is demand. Demand is growing across all sectors that we analyze, between 80 and 130 percent by 2050. And this is just this is not just a climate issue. Regardless of which scenario we follow, electricity is becoming more important. In the 2DS, energy efficiency moderates some of this growth growth in electricity demand, but this does not make the role of electricity any less important. In fact, across all scenarios, the growth of electricity as a share of overall energy demand grows from 17% in 2011 to 25% or even slightly more by 2050. But there is one key difference here. In the 2DS, by 2050, electricity overtakes oil products as the largest energy carrier in the energy system. The growth of electricity use is not necessarily a positive development. Let me reinforce the, uh, the message previously. We must actively manage this transition to support global goals for economic, secure, and low-carbon energy. In fact, if we look today at electricity generation, it consumes nearly 40% of global primary energy and produces 40% of global emissions. If we continue as we are, these trends will not change and will only increase in scale. But if we look at the, the two degree scenario, the growth in overall energy demand is moderate, moderated and the increased use of, of electricity means that the power sector now consumes over 50% of primary energy. But this is not the same as it is today. In fact, much of that comes from renewable or low carbon sources, but we'll talk about that more later. But when you look to the emissions profile, you see that it only contributes 5% of global emissions. So therefore, the electricity system is largely decarbonized. Now let's take a look at how we, we generate that electricity. When we look at the shares today, we see that fossil fuels produce nearly 70% of electricity, whereas renewables only produce 20% of all electricity. When we look under the 2DS scenario in 2050, we see a reversal where renewables produce 65% of all electricity and fossil fuels have shifted down to 20%.
this is a huge change. Un and under this reversal, we see the greatest growth coming from variable renewable generation, such as wind and solar. And they in just wind, wind and solar themselves account for 30% of all electricity generation by 2050. The result of this is that the system variability, so the variability in the electricity system will increase and op new operating paradigms will be required to operate the electricity system with this increased flexibility with the same levels of reliability to, as we have today. So now I want to just shift a little bit before I go on, uh, on, on some of those topics. Up to this point we have been talking about the global trends on electricity system development. But when it actually is evolved, transformed, it is done so on a regional basis. So let's take a look at this slide a little bit. What we see is when we look at OECD member countries or developed countries and uh, compare that to developing uh, countries or emerging economies, we see a much, different uh, a much different direction. In OECD countries, what we see is that growth between now and 20, uh, 2050 is very, very small. It averages around 16% uh, across the, the countries. But when we look at the non-OECD regions, we see much higher growth, averaging over 145%. So the challenge in OECD regions with low growth is that they will need to maintain a high level of reliability, typical of electricity supply, with low growth of revenues and an aging infrastructure. You can contrast that with the challenge in non-OECD regions, which will be to manage large investments needed to meet the growth in demand for electricity. But with these large investments in infrastructure, they have the opportunity to use best-in-class technology as they build out their electricity systems. And one of the interesting things that we looked at in a little bit more detail this year was um, in the situation in India. And what we see in India is that even in the 2DS scenario where um, electricity demand is, is moderated over time, we see growth to be in the order of 300%. And they face two major challenges. One is adequately powering the projected economic growth that they expect in India, and also bringing electricity to the 300 million citizens who currently lack access. While nearly 75% of the electricity in India comes from coal, it does need to be commended for its ambitious plans to better exploit its abundant potential for generation from low carbon sources. But one last thing on India is that they do need to address uh, complex administrative processes and the investment risks bringing those down is, is vital um, to decrease the high cost of financing. So earlier I talked about um, the increased deployment of variable renewables and the increased amount of variability in the electricity system. Well, this is going to need increased flexible flexibility resources. And what we see is that there are four large-scale types of flexibility, but I'm going to focus on two today. Um, that is dispatchable thermal generation and storage. When we look uh, over the medium term, we see that natural gas thermal generation in the 2DS um, shows a strong interplay between variable renewables and the flexibility of natural gas generation to provide both baseload as well as balancing generation to support renewable, uh, renewable deployments. Gas-fired generation supports two elements of a cleaner energy system, increasing the integration of renewables, but also has the capability to displace coal-fired generation. In regions with ambitious deployment for renewable electricity, uh, part load efficiency, ramp rate, turn down ratios and startup times are going to be more relevant for gas fired plants than full load efficiency. efficiency. Now moving to storage, I know that this is a, a very much hyped topic. Uh, we see many different articles on storage in the news um, and especially we hear breakthroughs in battery technologies and I think it's tempting to think that storage is going to be the the one solution that's going to uh, solve all the problems of flexibility and the integration of renewables. But we took a close look at it this year and, and what we see is several conclusions. For one is that we see that storage technologies come in all shapes and sizes from gigawatt scale pumped hydro to batteries in, in, the, in your mobile phone, not to mention thermal storage technologies. 
the technology is not the same for all applications. And for the moment, apart from pumped hydro and the electricity system, the contribution of power storage is minimal due to higher costs and in insufficient performance. Indeed, affordable, large-scale and distributed storage can be a major contributor to grid optimization and flexibility to integrate wind and solar. But we think, and we, we do think that wind could be a very important technology in the global electricity system over the long term, as research and development are, are providing some very compelling results. But our analysis did not quite support the optimism over power storage for now. We believe that while there are a number of near-term opportunities for storage, in many applications the costs need to come down by several factors in order to be competitive. Previously I mentioned the role of natural gas for power generation for baseload electricity production. Let me start by saying that natural gas should only be seen as a bridge to cleaner technologies unless CCS is deployed. By 2025, gas demand continues to rise, but after 25 in the two degree scenario, emissions from gas fired plants are higher than the average carbon intensity of the global electricity mix. So their mix, and therefore natural gas loses its status as a low carbon fuel. Recognizing that base load gas fired plants will require CCS to meet the 2DS targets, we undertook a comparison of the costs and benefits of applying CCS to both coal and gas fired generation. And we came up with some interesting results. When we look at the cost per ton of CO2, it is higher for gas than coal. But that's not the actual goal here. The goal is to provide low cost, clean electricity. So when we compare the cost of low emissions electricity, gas is more attractive than coal fired generation. So this finding reflects the importance of developing and using the right policy to meet the right goals. Comparing generation technologies based on the cost of low carbon electricity shows where CCS for gas can be more effective and more effectively support the transition to a low carbon energy system. So far I've largely talked about the supply side of the electricity system, but let me move to the demand side. Decarbonization of electricity has spillover spillover effects in all end use sectors, mainly in the building and industry sectors, but also in transportation. The impact of power system decarbonization is most prevalent in the building sector, which already uses 50% of global electricity generation. By increasing the shares of electricity demand while decarbonizing the electricity system, positive spillover effects occur, and end use sectors are automatically decarbonized. Let me look a little bit more detail at the different sectors. Electrification of transport delivers substantial benefits. For example, although electricity makes up only 11% of total energy demand by 2050 in the 2DS, it accounts for approximately 50% of transport efficiency gains. So that shows that by using electricity in vehicles, you are, gaining, you are improving the efficiency of those vehicles and decreasing fossil fuel um, uh, fossil fuel consumption, um, but also then that allows you to move to fully electric vehicles. But it, that is not to say that electrification of transport can offer emission reductions in all situations. If you have a highly emitting electricity system, electrifying transport may lead to higher emissions and not less. In ETP 2014, we have developed a tool called the Low Carbon Electric Transport Maximization Index, or LETMIX. Using this tool, we're, we're able to offer analysis and advice as to what situations can, off, can offer the maximum benefit to electrifying transport based on individual country situations. Looking at the building sector, we see that heat pumps for cooling, heating or cooling of space and water not only reduce emissions, but also allow electricity to displace the use of natural gas. The, we did a variant of the, the 2DS called the 2DS Electrified Buildings, looking at both the European Union and China, and considered the deployment of heat pumps beyond 2DS levels for both space and water heating applications. In addition to reducing overall energy use and emissions, the EU gas shares fall from 34% in 2011 to a 2050 level of 32% in the 2DS and then even lower at 25% in the 2DS electrified building scenario. 
looking at China, in 2011, the share of natural gas in buildings was around 6 6%. In the 2DS, large expected economic growth and urbanization drive up China, China's building energy consumption by 25% in 2050. And increased demand for space heating and water heating drive the share of natural gas for those purposes to almost 20%. But again, we see that in the electrified building scenario, this helps to decrease that growth uh, in natural gas demand in China. As part of a special feature this year, ETP 2014 explores the hidden energy implications of more and more devices going online. As internet access and usage spreads at a rapid rate, data volumes increase exponentially and consumer demand for smart network enabled devices surge. So does the energy consumption for these devices. The electricity demand of network enabled devices is expected to almost double between 2013 and 25. And as these devices spend most of their time in standby mode, up to 80% of their electricity consumption can be needed just to maintain the connection for the network. If we can reduce that amount, these savings can add up. In fact, global electricity demand of network-enabled edge devices and network equipment could be slashed by 65% by just implementing best available technologies, resulting in a savings of almost 740 terawatt hours per year. That corresponds to about 4% of current global final electricity production. That's a lot of energy that can be saved. Now, one of the, uh, the last topics uh, that we cover in detail is financing of low carbon generation. And this, as we said right at the very beginning, this is very important during the transition to a low carbon electricity system. Current low carbon generation is not only more convensive, more expensive than conventional generation such as uh, combined cycle gas turbines but it is also more capital intensive. The increased upfront capital costs can increase the various risks perceived by investors such as construction risk, electricity price risk or carbon policy risk as, among others and these risks threaten to limit investment needed to power to the power sector for low carbon generation and policymakers need to find ways to limit these risks, but to do so in a way that is transparent and is done in a way that meets uh, large-scale policy goals. So how do you clear the obstacles on the road towards a clean energy future? We're reiterating some of the messages from ETP 2012 on ways to transform our energy system, but this is especially important for electricity systems. One key conclusion is that a sustainable electricity system is a smarter, more unified and integrated electricity system. When we look at today's system, it's centralized in one direction. But tomorrow's system will be decentralized and multi-directional. Complex and diverse individual technologies will need to work as one. Technologies, they must be deployed together rather than isolation. And policy should address the electricity system as a whole rather than individual technologies. And success of doing this will hinge on systems thinking. That's because it's more efficient by identifying synergies across sectors and applications. It enables the use of new technologies and new market models. And it focuses on the, en the efficiency of the service provided rather than just the energy delivered. So, Today we've given you just a taste of the analysis we have done in 2014, but I just want to share with you uh, the number of topics that we cover this year. One is that we look at solar, solar energy, not only photovoltaics, but also um, concentrating solar power or solar thermal electricity. There's significant cost reductions that have been happening in this, and we look at how far can we push this by 2050. We also look at the evolving role of natural gas, being able to provide flexible generation or baseload production, and we've touched on some of those points today. As electrification is easier and cheaper for some transport modes than for others, we've taken a look into what modes can provide a good opportunity in the near term and what are some long-term benefits for these. Can, can e-mobility actually replace oil? Complementing the development of the IEA storage roadmap this year, again, we've looked at the role of electricity storage and do we really need it in the energy system and what role can it play? 
Um, I touched upon financing earlier. We dig into what are the future power generation project risk profiles and how will they be compared with historic approaches and conventional technologies. And we want to evaluate and provide some answers as to the need for novel investment vehicles, market structures, and policies. And lastly, we've looked at India as a very interesting case study with its high growth and its need to electrify millions in its population. What are they doing and what can they be doing uh, to do this in a low carbon manner? In conclusion, I want to point out one thing first is that there's a significant amount of visualization, data visualization and downloadable data when you purchase the ETP 2014. So I want to leave you with three messages in addition to that. First, we must manage the energy transition rather than respond to economic and climate events. Secondly, that electricity will play a central role in that process and in economic growth. And so putting technical and organizational pieces of that puzzle together will be key. And finally, that in order to do all of this, we require strong leadership from both policymakers and industry. And this means embracing a shared vision that looks to the long term with regard to both investment and policy and mobilizing the necessary financing now rather than paying a much higher price down the road. So with that, I say thank you very much. Great, and thank you to uh, both the panelists for the excellent presentations. And at this point, I'd just like to remind the audience that if you have any questions, you can submit those through the question pane in the GoToWebinar window. Uh, and with that, I'll move on to the first question that we did receive from the audience. And they ask if you could elaborate more on the fuel switching in context of the second slide. And I believe this was during Didier's presentation. Um, but it, oh, it does say by Mr. David. Um, it's the way. Um, fuel switching. Well, one of those, uh, one of the key aspects of um, decreasing carbon intensity is moving away from the, the more dirty fuels. So this can be uh, largely around moving from uh, coal to natural gas. So you're still using fossil fuels, um, but you're using a cleaner based fossil fuel. Natural gas has about half the uh, emissions intensity compared to uh, to coal-fired generation. So that's one of the, the major ones that we see. Um, but what it also touches on at times is uh, fuel switching uh, within transport as well. That's another thing where you're moving from, um, from uh, fossil fuels to electricity. That can be another form of switching that can uh, offer those savings. If I may add a compliment, if the question was on the uh, uh, on the what's called the wet slide showing the difference between the 60s and the 2ds so where uh, where will the reductions from 6ds to 2ds come come from uh, we have uh, uh, the first one is uh, uh, is end use fuel and electricity efficiency at 38 percent so energy efficiency at low level is the key tool to uh, reach the 2ds target then we have renewables at 30 percent which is higher than in previous etp why? Because we take into account progress, and as we said, when we track progress, we see that renewables are, have even uh, overshot, uh, overshot the uh, objective, so uh, they are playing an increasing role in our, uh, model, uh, in our model in the 2DS scenario. Uh, um, and and, and on, on conversely, CCS at 14% and nuclear at 7% continue to uh, bring a significant contribution to the 2DS scenario, but at lower level than two years ago in our previous modeling exercise. Great, thank you both. Um, <clears throat> the next question that just came in is, what is the future role of nuclear power in the 2DS scenario? Well, as, as I, I would start, and maybe, maybe we'll uh, complement. As, as, as we just said, um, the uh, uh, nuclear continue to, pay, uh, to play a significant role, but at a lower level than, than two years ago, because we take into consideration, of course, the decision made by uh, a number of countries 
uh, to uh, uh, phase out nuclear, to slow down the investment in nuclear, but at the same time uh, we see that uh, nuclear investment continue to move forward in, in, in a number of countries, in particular in emerging countries, uh, because on one side we have 80% of the nuclear fleet in OECD countries, but 80% of the new build and, and 72 reactors are under construction and uh, most of them in uh, emerging countries. So we take that into consideration in our, uh, in our model, but uh, we do think that nuclear has a significant role to play uh, in, in, in moving in the direction of the 2DS. Exactly. And I just want to add to that, one of the things I didn't mention that we did this year is we actually did a 2DS high, high renewables variant. And in this variant, what we constrained is uh, the development of both nuclear technology and CCS deployment. And what we found in that case is that um, renewables make up a much larger uh, share of the global generation system by 2050. But what happens is that we see a higher cost. So in the, the higher cost of the high renewable scenario is about $4.5 trillion higher but there's an additional 2.5 trillion in savings. So the overall additional cost of the uh, high renewables variant is about $2 trillion relative to the 2DS scenario. Thank you. Great, thanks again. Um, and moving on to the next question, where does India stand today in terms of the ratio of fossil fuel to renewables generation? And where do you predict it will be in 2050? Well, India is uh, largely depending on, on fossil fuel and mainly on, uh, on coal for its uh, energy supply. And, uh, um, and even if uh, uh, India has uh, adopted a low-carbon growth strategy for its uh, power sector, uh, this is, uh, it still very much depends on, uh, on uh, coal. And um, from that perspective, also another, another point that we, we, we flag in the chapter in India is that India, uh, India needs, uh, as, as one of the first objective is to bring uh, electricity supply to 300 million Indians that are lacking access to electricity. And uh, uh, so the uh, India generation is projected to increase by a factor of 2.5 in the 2DS and a factor 3 in the 4DS. So the question of uh, energy access is very, is very key. So what India needs to do, considering the high dependence on coal, is to move to clean coal technologies because today around 60% of uh, subcritical units built in the world are built in India. So there is still even a lot of new build, majority of new builds uh, in coal-fired plants that are subcritical so that do not use the existing clean coal technology that would be uh, already much more efficient and, uh, um, and, and provide less air quality problems. And the second thing is to, uh, the India needs to expand nuclear capacity uh, to achieve a low carbon growth scenario as well as developing further uh, renewables because India has a significant uh, potential in terms of uh, renewables, including hydro power, uh, to um, to uh, diversify its uh, uh, energy supply, in particular the electricity mix. And I'll, I'll just add to that one of the the parts of our analysis to to twenty. Uh, for India is actually we, we carried out our detailed analysis only out to 2030 for India. When we did our global analysis, of course, we, ca we carried all countries out to, uh, to 2050. But what we find is that with the explosive growth that we see in India, it looking out to, 20, uh, to 2050 just became highly, uh, highly uncertain um, because they are going through such growth and such transition uh, where they move uh, away from from coal if they do follow a, a two degree scenario path. So just to, just wanted to add that that we um, we have done the work to out to 2030, um, but we don't actually go out to 2050 in the uh, detailed scenarios of India. Thank you. Thanks, India and uh, David. And the next question asks. How do you make government see the energy system as a whole? And they give some context. Uh, big generation projects are considered more attractive politically uh, in several areas than promoting energy efficiency or demand management policy, uh, such as in the UK. 
how do you reverse the trend as the report says governments must? Um, that's a very good question. Thank you. It's always true that, that, that governments and policymakers are more interesting on the, on the supply side and also sometimes analysts are more interested in the supply side than the, on the demand side. And at the same time, we uh, really uh, emphasize in the report that energy efficiency in the first tool to move to a two degree uh, scenario. And what we see is that uh, higher energy prices have led some efficiency gains, so there is a strong rationale for energy efficiency investment, but that uh, we're not on track if you look at the different end use sectors. And uh, this confirms that governments must uh, intervene in markets to correct uh, market failures. And uh, examples are, are, uh, of this need include policies such as vehicle fuel standards or building codes uh, that have been found to be necessary to improve efficiency and very effective then when they're effectively put in, put in place. And we also point out uh, in our work at the IEA uh, on the multiple benefits of energy efficiency associated benefits get, that can be very significant in terms of the economy, health and the environment. So these are really issues for, uh, for uh, governments. Uh, so uh, there is a need for more uh, government intervention to incentivize uh, investment in energy efficiency, uh, but we do think that the high, uh, uh, protracted high energy prices and uh, uh, provide a very strong rationale to encourage governments to do more in terms of uh, energy efficiency policy. Uh, and we see that energy efficiency policy are much more discussed uh, among governments and policy makers, in particular in emerging uh, countries that are struggling also with the cost of high imports uh, for fossil fuels. And, and I'll just add to that as well. Um, the, the demand side in, in energy efficiency is, is just one of those large, large levers um, on, on systems thinking that is not fully being exploited. But we're also, um, two, two additional points. One is that the, the theory and the, the understanding of, of systems-based thinking is, is um, starting to, to come to fruition a little bit. There's, there's much more thought of this. And I think that's also due to the convergence of increased uh, information and communications technology. So we have more tools to use uh, through smart grids um, is, is I think the best example and, and the convergence of um, the transport system with the electricity system. That's an example of two where today those two energy systems are largely separate. As we start to see more electric vehicles we have a, a crossover and that's going to push um, uh, more systems thinking and, and saying how can we leverage those electric vehicles to support the electricity system and then conversely how can we operate those uh, electric vehicles so that they don't cause problems in the electricity system. So I think as these questions uh, come more and more that uh, these crossovers between uh, systems that are right now separate, uh, governments and policymakers are going to have to face this but we're trying to say get ahead of the curve, start looking at it now, start doing this long-term strategic planning now so that you can be more active in this trans transition rather than uh, reactive. Thank you. All right, thank you both. And the next question that I've received from the audience asks, do you think that in variable renewable energy-based power systems, the energy-only market has to be complemented by capacity-based market schemes in order to guarantee security of the supply in the long run? Well, capacity market is an issue which is very much discussed in, 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 in electricity reforms, in particularly in European countries where the share of renewables is going uh, is becoming larger and larger, which uh, which uh, uh, brings up an issue in terms of profitability for the back of, uh, backup generation capacity from fossil fuels. And we are, we've seen recently a lot of uh, gas fire uh, uh, electricity plants being shut down in Europe because of uh, the lack of profitability if they're run on, 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 on a limited time base. Uh, but the, so the uh, capacity market is certainly one of the one of the options to ensure, uh, to uh, um, enable a wide share of re intermittent renewable um, uh, power generation, but it's not the only one. There is a very, as we 
shown in the slides, there is a variety of uh, options to improve uh, the flexibility of power system uh, and make it possible to accommodate higher share of renewables, in, in, including, of course, backup ge uh, dispatchable uh, um, generation, uh, but also the demand side response and, and, and a lot of uh, um, upside can come from uh, smart grids in particular and demand side uh, reactions, but also uh, energy storage for a set uh, application and also improved interconnections and wider electricity market like having more an internal market in, in Europe. So capacity markets is one of the options, not the only one. Uh, but it needs to be looked at, looked at now very carefully in terms of uh, ensuring the, uh, the um, uh, security of uh, power supply. Uh, but at which level it would, should be put in place is another issue because there is a risk of uh, having different markets in different European countries so if capacity markets are just developed at national level. Thank you. All right, thank you, Didier. And uh, what is your opinion on countries that have hydro as their base load and cannot switch to natural gas, especially considering that hydro is climate vulnerable? Well, hydro, hydro is, uh, is, 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 is some vulnerability in the case of droughts, um, but they have also a tremendous advantages for the renewables. They have no CO2 emission impact. They are very cost effective. I think the, the countries that are that are that have a, a rich uh, hydro endowment, like like Canada, like Brazil, like Norway, uh, have a very interesting uh, asset. And I think the the, the, the vulnerability can be can be addressed through a, 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 through a portfolio approach in terms of renewables. And we can see Brazil developing other renewable sources like uh, biomass, solar, wind, uh, and, 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 and the, other, the other way to address the vulnerability of hydro is having a, a wider market as it is the case in Nordic countries where you have a, 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 an electricity market, the North Pole that covers all the Scandinavian countries and, and for which you have a variety of, uh, of, of electricity uh, mix uh, which, uh, which uh, would help address a, a drought case uh, in hydro production in Norway, for instance. Thank you. Thank you, Didier. Uh, and what is the definition of renewable energy that was applied in the research? Uh, it's, uh, we include, uh, include large-scale renewable. Uh, or large-scale large hydro as a renewable energy, um, and uh, solar, wind, uh, biomass, um, geothermal, uh, ocean. So you know it's it's a very wide uh, wide definition. And I guess the key one is uh, it includes large-scale hydro. Great, thank you, David. Um, and next question is uh, asked with respect to the allure of coal. As you mentioned, in the need to scale up clean coal solutions and invest in clean coal storage, uh, or carbon capture storage, sorry, uh, this is largely understood as in respect to new coal. How do you deal with existing coal? Uh, that's one of the very difficult questions because in the 2DS where you need to face out progressively subcritical coal, so all the uh, older coal uh, power plants, and depending on the uh, sub-scenarios, the level of uh, phasing out uh, uh, subcritical coal is, is different, but uh, um, in our 2D scenario, basically you entirely decarbonize the uh, power generation system through uh, renewables first, through uh, nuclear and uh, fossil fuels um, that needs to be accompanied by CCS to be uh, entirely decarbonized. And we have a specific chapter actually on, on natural gas where which shows that natural gas power, gen, power generation is uh, increasing uh, until 2025, but then afterwards it uh, starts to decrease because even in terms of, uh, in terms of CO2 emissions, uh, gas uh, fire plants are, uh, have a, a CO2 emission level which is higher than the average uh, power generation in the 2DS scenarios, which means that they need to be accompanied for baseload generation uh, by uh, CCS. And we uh, specifically uh, looked at the uh, comparison between uh, uh, coal fire plants per CCS and, and gas fire plants per CCS and show that uh, CCS for gas is actually uh, probably a more cost 
effective option if you look at uh, the uh, carbon emission per um, electricity generated. Uh, and I'll just add a, a small point is that, um, yes, uh, dealing with old plants or, or subcritical plants um, uh, and putting CCS on them is, is very difficult and sometimes uh, highly uh, non-cost effective. But in the 2DS, uh, as part of that, we do account for the decommissioning of about 100 or 850 gigawatts of thermal generation before its technical life. Uh, so what that really demonstrates is that as we make those investment decisions for infrastructure that's going to be around for a long time, uh, sometimes we have to make the hard decisions of actually um, decommissioning them before their technical life is over. Thank you. Thank you. And um, one of the attendees asked, uh, states that geothermal has not been included in the scenario yet. Could you uh, give reasons for excluding that? No, I don't think geothermal is excluded. I think geothermal is, in, is included. But actually, when we track progress, we say renewable on track are even beyond the targets. But we are specifically looking at uh, uh, wind and solar that are the fastest growing uh, renewable sources even if even if they start from a lower basis and and actually these uh, intermittent renewable sources uh, raises the most difficult issues in terms of integration into the grid but um, other uh, other renewable sources like geothermal uh, biomass or um, or offshore wind for instance are also uh, are also sources that play a role but insufficient. Actually, progress has been very slow for offshore wind, for uh, 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 or geothermal or ocean uh, energy. And in our uh, uh, 2D scenario, they uh, contribute to uh, four percent uh, of electricity generation compared to almost z to, to 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 practically zero uh, today. So they play a role. Uh, not, not enormous, but they, they start to play a role in, in particular uh, after 2025. Thank you. Thank you, Didier. And well, let me see, I just had another question come in. When you state that nuclear power deployment is not on track in contrast to renewable energy, could you just uh, elaborate a little bit on what you mean by that? Um, the, 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 what, what we call on track, we have a chapter which is called Tracking Clean Energy Progress. Uh, it's actually an update of a report that we've uh, published every year over the last years for the Clean Energy Ministerial and which basically looks at what has been happening over, over the last 12 months in 2013 uh, in terms of progress for uh, in clean energy and we looked at all the uh, technology options and, and, and and, and just one was in, in red in the slide I, I just showed for renewables and because we track progress against an intermediary milestone of the 2D scenario um, in 2025. Uh, so basically they, it's, a, it's a decomposition of the 2DS where we look at where we would need to, to be in 2025 um, and, and are we getting close to that, to that uh, uh, target uh, now. Uh, or not, and in nuclear, clearly, we've not been on track for uh, obvious reasons. Several uh, countries have uh, decided to phase out nuclear, and, and, and in 2013, uh, even if a number of, uh, of nuclear plants are under construction, in terms of uh, new starts, uh, it, it has not been uh, a year of, of, for uh, the launch of many projects in terms of new nuclear plants. So it's basically a factual assessment of what has been happening in 2013 um, and uh, it uh, uh, leads us to revise a bit the contribution of nuclear in the 2D scenario by 2050 when we uh, update our model of what, what we do every two years and not every year. And I'll, I'll just add to that uh, a small comment is that when we look at um, our trajectory that we're on today, we actually see a very high uncertainty when we say we're, we're on track. We think we're going to be between 5 and 23 percent off target by 2025. Now that's a very wide range, but that's because we don't exactly know um, are some of these plans uh, for new, new plants actually going to go through or aren't they? Uh, are countries going to make more decisions uh, to phase out nuclear or 
or not. So therefore, um, we, uh, we see a large uncertainty. Thank you. All right, thank you. And in terms of more strategic system thinking for cost-effective transformation of the energy system, can you reflect a bit on the need for a more active demand side and why your analysis looked only at dispatchable generation and storage as the key options for more flexible resources? Well, actually, when we look at um, this year, we did, we did uh, uh, quite a detailed analysis on the storage side. Now, storage is neither supply nor load, it's both. And so one of the first things that we learned about this type of analysis is it's highly complex. And uh, you can say the exact same thing about the demand side. So the reason we haven't done it yet is because we focused on storage this year and we're going to be moving in that direction over the next couple years. We see that the demand side right now is largely focused on providing peak demand reduction. And I think that's a, a very important uh, issue, and I would say it's important for uh, virtually every single electricity system, and probably not only virtually, important for every electricity system in the world. But what we want to see is the use of demand side for also increasing system flexibility. And what that means is instead of only decreasing demand, sometimes in situations of excess power generation from either wind or solar, actually increasing demand for a period of time to absorb that and then turning off at a later time so you have no um, increased use of electricity. You've only shifted it. So all that to say is we see this as a, a very important issue. We're starting to analyze more and more on this, um, this side of the equation and uh, uh, we see it uh, essential, important, and, and highly interesting. All right, and if you could summarize the ETP uh, 2014 in three key points, uh, what do you think those would be? Yes, um, if I had to summarize in three points, which is uh, this uh, report, uh, I would say that we have uh, uh, the first message is that the electricity is going to play a defining role in the first half of the century as the energy career. Uh, that increasingly powers economic growth, as I said before. And uh, so the importance of uh, uh, getting right the electricity system and decarbonize it uh, is certainly one of the, the first message. The second is that we must embrace a shared vision uh, that looks to the long term uh, in terms of investment and, and policy and, and, and mobilize the necessary financing. And uh, the third message, uh, which is also linked to the um, to the uh, uh, tracking report is that we're not making the progress that is necessary to ensure a low carbon energy system and a change of course is, uh, is actually needed. And I would say maybe I, I would add another one which is, which is the importance of having a, a system thinking, a global thinking about the energy system rather than, uh, than looking at just a specific options uh, uh, or specific technologies uh, side by side but uh, one by one. Uh, but really to take a, a system approach on the future of our energy system. Thank you. Great, and I, I did receive another question that has multiple parts to it, so let me read through and I can repeat it if you need me to. Uh, what kind of analysis is carried out on the power sector in India? Did it include modeling of the entire sector? And if so, is it a state-wise or national study? And then what were the key results from the study described as the last chapter as ETP 2014? All right, so this was, uh, sorry, in reference India. to India? Yeah, India. Okay, so the, um, um, the, the system, we did look at the, uh, the system with a certain amount of um, aggregation, but also uh, in terms of the, the country as a whole. But we did look at some of the issues as to around uh, where the uh, electricity generation is happening and, and where the demand center. Um, so from that perspective, um, I'd say it's a, a bit of a hybrid. The analysis overall um, on ETP is uh, quite, um, quite high level. We uh, des describe the world across uh, 28 regions. Uh, so, but 
India is uh, treated as a, a separate country because it's such a, a large consumer and, and has such uh, greater growth. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the general, I guess, conclusions on this, um, I could go on um, forever, and I think we've, we've largely covered it on, on a general basis, but we see huge growth uh, in electricity demand. Uh, especially under the, the six degree scenario. And if they don't move towards decarbonization, they're going to need uh, more and more coal uh, for this generation. And although there is a large amount of coal available within India, there are still some struggles. They, still, they actually are importing a large amount of coal today, um, uh, despite having indigenous resources. So therefore, from an energy security point of view, uh, it makes sense for them to diversify anyways. Um, we still see them using a fair amount of coal out to 2030, quite, uh, that's quite logical, um, and using hopefully moving to more indigenous coal. But they need to get away from um, the subcritical plants um, if they're going to have any hopes of, of having a more low carbon system. So those are just a, a couple of conclusions. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now and, and encourage you, of course, to, uh, to check out the book for the, uh, the full picture. Thank you. Great. And I'd just like to thank uh, Didia and David again for that great discussion. That is the last question that I had from the audience. Um, so at this point, uh, David, Didia, if you have any last comments or closing remarks that you'd like to make, I'd like to um, give you a chance here. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone, the, the, the Clean Energy Solutions Center, for organizing with us this, uh, this uh, uh, webinar. Thanks a lot. And to all participants for their very good questions. And I would invite everyone to buy the book or read it. Uh, I would like to point out that you can download the Tracking Clean Energy Progress Report, which is one chapter, the update uh, from our website, and that you can uh, uh, and you can uh, have access now to the, PD, the ETP in PDF or in, uh, in hard copy, uh, which is now available from our website. And thanks again for, to all of you. David? Um, just to um, also say that uh, the data from the analysis, uh, when you purchase the book, it's uh, fully downloadable. And, and um, from fully downloadable from the web. And uh, this allows you to really use our analysis to, to do your own uh, examination, your own figures. Uh, but in addition to that, you can also download all our figures that are in the book, use them for PowerPoints, um, and that does include the Excel data that makes those uh, figures. So we're really making an effort to uh, not only produce a, a high quality p uh, publication, but also give you a lot of data uh, that you can use for your respective work. Thank you. Great. Thank you again. Um, and now I would just like to ask our audience to take a minute to answer a quick survey. We just have three short questions for you, and your feedback is just allows us to know what we're doing well and where we can improve for future webinars. Uh, so Heather, if you could go ahead and display that first question for the audience. And the question is, the webinar content provided me with useful information and insight. And you can respond right in the GoToWebinar window. And the next question, Heather. The webinar's presenters were effective. Great. And the final question is, overall, the webinar met my expectations. Great. Thank you for answering our survey. And on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I would like to extend another thank you to our expert panelists and to each of our attendees for participating in today's webinar. Uh, very much appreciate the time and the questions that you submitted for the discussion. And I invite everyone to check the Solutions Center website over the next few weeks if you would like to view the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentations. 
as well as any previously held webinars. And additionally, you will find information on upcoming webinars and other training events. We also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about Solutions Center's resources and services, including the Ask an Expert Policy Support. Hope everyone has a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. And this concludes our webinar.